come to you thanking you, Father, for your son that you've given us. Thank you, Father, for the gift uh, that you gave us with your son. He paid a debt that we couldn't pay, a debt that he didn't owe. And so, we, Father, we just give you thanks and praise for that this morning. We celebrate uh, a, risen, a risen Savior this morning, Lord, and we just uh, we pray that we glorify you here this morning. We pray that what we say, what we sing, the word that is spoken, we glorify you and you alone. And we make our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand and join and sing with us in worship?
to see you beautiful, colorful people out here this morning at the Potter's House. Uh, we're so grateful you've chosen to worship with us today. And we declare today, we declare every Sunday that Christ is risen and that he is risen indeed. And, and if you don't have a place where you regularly worship, we'd love for you to come, continue to come back and be with us every Sunday. I want to just draw your attention to a couple of announcements really quick this morning. Uh, don't forget, uh, women's ministry meetings meeting this Tuesday at 6 p.m., and then next Sunday morning, uh, before services, men's ministry will, will meet at 8.30. And uh, I always like when the guys meet early because we get the first pick of donuts. So, uh, guys, if you show up here early for men's ministry meeting, you get donuts first. Um, uh, because it is spring break, and we have some folks traveling today um, and this week on spring break, remember those uh, that couldn't be here today for whatever reason, we aren't going to have a kids' house and youth house this week uh, because we will have a lot of folks out and about, and that includes volunteers and even some of our uh, students that are normally here uh, during the week. But we'll resume a uh, week from uh, this Wednesday. Also, if you need uh, some information on uh, your church giving, uh, again, we have a couple of locations located here, the tithes and offering box here. There's also a tithe and offering box out there in the, near the Welcome Center, across the, uh, across the foyer from the Welcome Center. Uh, and if you want a giving statement uh, for tax purposes, uh, there's a sign-up sheet there, and uh, that way we can get you that, uh, that information. And, uh, you can do with it whatever you wish. Uh, there's also all, all the time ongoing ministry projects, and you can see those in your bulletin. Uh, one of the things we always want to highlight is the fact that this time of year, we receive the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And what that does, that supports over 2,900 church planners and missionaries right here in North America. So as, as I mentioned to you uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Christianity is growing on every continent in the world except for America and Europe. And that may blow your minds, but we need a, a North American mission board to continue to do missions, even right here. So every penny you give toward the Annie Armstrong Easter offering goes toward missions right here in North America. Uh, so um, I, I, again, want to uh, impress that upon you. I've got a special announcement at the close uh, of the service today. Uh, again, no services this, this evening. Normally... On a normal Sunday, this is where we transition out for Children's Church because today's Easter Sunday. We wanted today to be generational worship. Everybody's in big church today, and that's okay. And uh, so if we hear babies crying, glory be to God uh, for that. So that's good. That's a good thing. Uh, so, uh, uh, but normally, uh, if, you're, if you're here and you have little ones, we normally dismiss during this time for Children's Church, but we won't doing that today so our volunteers can be here in here on Easter Sunday. All right. I think that takes care of most of the announcements. And so uh, uh, if, and if you came in late and you're still looking for a place to sit, we put about 30 extra chairs on this side. So we're trying to even things out. You all filled up over here early today. 
uh, but uh, that's all right. We're, again, we're so very grateful to be here with you. Uh, I know Avery covered your prayers. My son Avery was, is preaching today at Iuka Baptist. He's been filling, there all, filling in there all month long. And uh, um, so you, you remember him in prayer today as well. This is his first Easter Sunday sermon, and that's, uh, that's always a special thing. So Anyway, I think it takes care of announcements. Uh, so let's go Lord in prayer again, and then we're going to have a time of uh, a greeting and handshake, especially if you didn't get to greet someone uh, when you first got here. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord God, we can thank you and praise you, O oh God, for this day. We're so very grateful uh, to, to ga- gather here today in this place and sing of the living hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, that we can do so boldly and confidently because Jesus Christ is indeed risen from the dead. And Lord, that's a hope that carries us through the, the, the crushing tidal waves of pain and suffering in this life. Lord, it carries us uh, to a secure future, Lord. It, 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 it lets us know that, that our past failures, Lord, have been wiped clean. And Lord, we also realize that every moment that we live here on this earth, it matters and it's purposeful and has meaning. So Lord, I just pray that you would lead us the remainder of our time of worship today, that Christ would be honored. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here in this service today that needs to make that wonderful and blessed decision to say yes to Jesus and, and say yes to the forgiveness of their sins and trust in Christ for salvation, that today would be that wonderful day that they're eternally and completely redeemed. Lord, we love you, and Father, we need you. And this is all about you. It's not about us. For we ask all these things in Christ's blessed, holy, wonderful, matchless name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, let's do some more singing, and you say hello to someone you missed earlier, all right? God sent His Son, they called Him Jesus, He came to love.
Today we've got a, uh, an unusual passage, perhaps, for our uh, Easter sermon, uh, but we're going to be in 1 Corinthians today, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through verse number 20. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through verse number 20. The message entitled, is entitled today, Easter Changes Everything. It does. Easter changes everything. Um, 
my calling and my passion and my life is to be your pastor. Uh, that is my primary responsibility, but I've also been blessed to serve part-time as a community relations specialist for Livingston County Schools, and I've come to appreciate greatly how important communication is. Communication is really important because there are times when you can make a serious blunder, a marketing blunder or a PR blunder, and you get all the attention for all the wrong reasons. I wanted to show you a few slides, and I don't, slides, I don't even remember what these were. I found them earlier in the week, and uh, I think we're going to just go through them. So if you pull up slide number one, Michael, does your, do you, does your marketing do more harm than good? This one just says, wash and vacuum, send your citizens. So, you know, I, that's, I, I guess it's a pretty good price if you need your citizens, senior citizens washed and vacuumed. Uh, let's, let's move on. Uh, I thought this was weird, too. I, they just messed up the wording big time. I mean, maybe maybe you've got one of those kids, you know, and you can go free there if they've got gas. Uh, you know, we don't want you, you be careful with your hands. Uh, we, they don't need to be s Satanized, for sure. Uh, we, it would be good if they're sanitized, but uh, we don't want them Satanized. This is a very specific demographic. I thought this was really weird. Uh, it's only for disabled, elderly, pregnant children. Um, I mean, that you got to be, that's very specific. And I don't know too many people is going to be able to use that bathroom. This was horrible, by the way. And I wasn't, it's like you really should have put call 91 in bigger letters. And when you used your graphic for the person drowning, make sure it doesn't look like lots of laughs. So, you got to be careful there. Um, you probably don't see this on your screen, but that's supposed to be dynasty. But if you're like my wife, every buffet is nasty. So she doesn't like any buffet. But that's supposed to be dynasty. And this was, I think, hopefully this is the last one. We know where the beef is now. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's bad on two, two respects. Um, you don't want to put that on your sign if your restaurant, that your special ingredient is actually people. Plus, if you're trying to hire people in, that is not a promising future for you. So, uh, anyway, uh, I guess I think you'll agree with me. I thought that was a little bit of fun, but I think you'll agree with me. That was not what those places of businesses wanted to communicate. That's not what their goal was. That's not what they communicated, but they, they just didn't get their message across the way they intended to. So I want to be very careful of the message today because sometimes... Even as churches and as preachers of the gospel, we don't communicate with enough clarity. And, and, and I'll be honest, sometimes I'll get tongue-tied. I'm not the best orator on the face of this planet. Sometimes I'll get tongue-tied and, and things will come out of my mouth differently than what my brain intends. But what we're discussing today is not a minor issue. It's something that has, needs to be communicated and spoken with much clarity. Because this is not some tack on doctrine. This is not some unimportant matter. Because today is Resurrection Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. And we as a church need to communicate not only with you all, but with the entire world that we unashamedly and totally believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and He's alive forevermore. We don't buy into the liberal notion that Jesus might have spiritually just rose from the dead or something like that. We believe that the supernatural took place. That Jesus bodily, physically, literally rose from the grave. Immortal and incorruptible and never to die again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just a footnote to our faith. It is the foundation of our faith. You know, what I've seen in the last several years especially is that sometimes the resurrection becomes kind of a footnote with some teaching or preaching out there even with uh, even Christian films remember the passion of the Christ you know the resurrection at the end of the film is just kind of a footnote at the end all oh, the light shines and you see Jesus alive again the end and that's a good film in many ways but the resurrection was that one minute footnote there at the close of the film and it might as well have just been a post credit scene in a Marvel movie. Oh, by the way, Jesus is alive. 
But what is far more important than what happened before he died is what happened after. In fact, the world seems to me to be a little bit more open to looking at the cross than they are looking at the open tomb. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ has massive implications. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely critical to everything that we believe and really everything that we do in life. Easter changes everything. The question for you today is this. It's simple. Has Easter, has the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed everything for you? Now that's, a, that's an honest question, isn't it? Has the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed everything for you? And let's be further, furtherly honest. Some of you need to ask yourselves, has the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed anything for you? Is it relevant to your life at all? So today we're going to look at this snapshot in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is one of the most important entire chapters on the resurrection. We're just going to look at a snippet of it, but it's a very focal passage of this chapter. And in this chapter, what happens is the Apostle Paul is laying a groundwork, uh, an argument for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what he's presenting is kind of a dystopian reality, just kind of a what-if scenario. He's saying, what if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? What, what, would, what kind of implications would that carry? What if Jesus Christ didn't rise? What if Easter never happened? So let's consider the passage today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you would, let's please stand together as we honor the reading of God's word today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse number 12. It reads this way. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. And we are even found to be misrepresented, rep, misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just pray that you would meet with us in this place. Lord, settle in our hearts these important eternal truths. And Lord, may our lives be impacted by them. And Lord, uh, I also pray again that if there's someone here today that needs to be saved, that today would be that day of decision for them, that they yes, say yes to Jesus. For we ask all these things in his precious name. Amen. <clears throat> You all know that I like to preach through series, and it's important to know where Paul is arguing from and why he is arguing this scenario about the resurrection. You see, the church in Corinth had some problems. I mean, if you read the entire, entire epistle, they had some major issues. And so when he was writing to them, he was clearing up maybe any misunderstandings they had. Perhaps he was answering questions the church had. And, and, and so... He was writing to them about, evidently, there was some confusion on their part about the resurrection. And some of them doubted that resurrection could happen, period. Which, in turn, impacted whether or not they believed that Jesus rose from the grave. That's kind of how theology works. Your doctrine on one topic will affect another. And with the place in Corinth, that was a, a, a Greek pagan area, so they were impacted by the secular worldviews that were around them. And so they were, they were confused about the resurrection, or they didn't believe it, because in part they were kind of influenced by Plato's philosophy and other Greek thought that taught the immortality of the soul, but that all matter was evil. And so that in their theology, that we would all be floating spirits 
in an immaterial reality in the afterlife. Uh, and, and so folks doubted whether the resurrection of the dead was even a reality. And here's the truth. Our, now, the, in our secular worldview, that may not be uh, something people have qualms with, but people still doubt the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you ask most atheists what happens after they die, they'll just tell you, well, I believe I'll just be put in the ground, and that's the end of the story. People are still skeptical of the resurrection. I mean, you, can, uh, you, might, as well, you might as well drive around to all the different cemeteries, and you'll see, you, you don't see any, a lot of bodies getting out of there, do you? There's one right over the hill from my house. You don't see that happening. So people doubt the reality based on their own personal experience. So Paul's argument here is, he says, well, if resurrection doesn't happen, and it can't happen, then Christ isn't risen either then. And if Christ isn't risen, and he gives all these terrifying scenarios, he, like I said, he almost presents a dystopian reality what would happen if Christ didn't rise from the grave. And there's a whole lot we can learn here. So let's follow this argument laid out in the biblical text. And as we go through these with him, we'll see there's six tragic things that you need to consider if Christ is not risen. The very first of these is this, that preaching is profitless. Or you might want to say pointless. Now some of you are like, well, it kind of is, isn't it, Brother Andrew? I've heard a lot of pointless preaching. Well, I'm going to give you seven today. <laughs> you're going to have seven total points but, but a lot of people look at that in verse 14 this is what he says he says if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain if Jesus is still in the tomb he's as dead now as when they took him off the cross and then for me as a pastor as a preacher I've wasted basically 24 years of my life and I've just kind of played the fool I wasted five years of my life in Bible college and seminary if that's the case and, and wasted 22 years in ministry and pastoring churches if Christ has not been raised from the dead. And you know what? So, so the kind of scenario is this. He's saying, if Christ has not risen, I'm wasting my time preaching and you're wasting your time listening to me. I don't know who the bigger fool is. You, you there, me up here acting the fool, preaching God's word as if it were true, are you sitting there saying amen as if you believed it? If Christ is still dead, it would make more sense to celebrate bunnies and candies and, than a cross and an empty tomb, right? He says then preaching is in vain. Preaching is empty. It's worthless. It's profitless. It's pointless. If Christ is still in the grave. Why is that? Because the heart of the gospel is simple. Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen from the grave. And you'll find that at the beginning of this chapter, in verses 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen to what he says there. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He's saying, God did what he said he was going to do. He came to redeem us by dying on the cross for our sins. He rose again on the third day. And friends, there's no preacher can preach the gospel unless he preaches the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you that if there's anybody that can do that, then their preaching is profitless. It is pointless unless he points people to the risen Christ. Friends, without a risen Savior, there's no need for a sermon. Regardless of how beautiful, how inspiring, or great oratory it may be, how logical it may be, it's not really worth hearing. If Christ is not risen, that's why he calls preaching in vain if Christ is not risen. Here's a second sad reality. If Christ is not risen, then faith is foolish. Faith is foolish. He goes on to say in verse 14, If Christ is not risen, then your faith is also in vain. In other words, you're trusting in something that doesn't deserve your trust. He also says this in the book of Romans. He says, He is shown to be the Son of God, Jesus, shown to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. How can I know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? How can I know that Jesus Christ can redeem me? How, how do I know the Bible is true? How do I know that the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus Christ? I'll tell you how. He is risen from the dead. That is God's stamp of approval on all that Jesus was, said he was, and all that Jesus did. He was shown to be the Son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. 
We don't serve a dead Savior. A dead Savior is nobody's Savior. If Christ is not risen, then faith is foolish. It is empty. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. Your faith is only as good as the object of your faith. There's a lot of people in this world that are sincere about faith, aren't they? That are of different faith than the Christian faith. There are a lot of people who are sincere, but they, can also, they, would, they would be sincerely wrong because they put their faith in the wrong object. Because if, unless your faith is in the victorious Jesus Christ who has died in our place, bearing Calvary's uh, uh, burden and cross on our behalf, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is totally foolish. It's completely bankrupt. I heard a story many years ago about Muslim, and he became a Christian in Africa, and there's some of his friends that asked him, they said, why did you become a Christian? And he said this, he says, well, suppose you're going down the road and, and the road forked, and, and you didn't know which way to go. And there at the fork in the road, there were two men, one who was living and one who was dead. He said, who would you ask for directions? Pretty good point. We hear a great deal these days about which religion is the right religion. Well, how do you know what you're buying into off of eternal life? There's a simple way to answer that question. Follow the one who has risen from the dead. If Christ is not risen, then preaching is profitless, faith is foolish, and thirdly, if Christ is not risen, then the disciples were deceived. The disciples were deceivers if Christ is not risen. Verse 15, Paul says, Then we are found to be misrepresented God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. And you, I hope you catch his drift here. He's not saying simply, well, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we made a whoopsie. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, if Christ has not been raised, then we are false witnesses. We are phonies. He's using a court term. A false witness is someone who gets to the courtroom and knowingly and willingly perjures him and herself. He's a liar. He's a, he's, a, he's a hypocrite. He's a phony. And Paul's arguing that if Jesus Christ has not been raised, then those who saw the risen Christ are liars. They're imposters. And so he's speaking of himself, he's talking about the other disciples, and they're testifying all the years that Jesus is alive. And many have seen him. If you go back earlier in the passage, you'll see he actually gives a whole list of eyewitnesses who see the risen Christ. In verse 5, it starts there. It's showing about the validity, the historical validity of the resurrection. Verse 5, and that he, Jesus, appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom were, are still alive. Now, they're alive in 53 A.D. They're not alive right now, but they're alive in 53 A.D. when Paul was writing this epistle. Though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James and then the other apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And you might be here and you wonder about, or you question the historical validity of the resurrection. And you might say, well, preacher, how do you know that those disciples did just make it all that, Why did, Couldn't they just made it all up, Brother Andrew? I'll tell you how I know that's not the case. Because those disciples paid with their very own lives the testimony of the risen Christ. That Jesus Christ has risen. They suffered, they bled, and they died because they believed wholeheartedly. Because they had seen the risen Christ that he had risen from the dead. You know, one scholar noted this. He said, throughout history, when someone teaches something they know to be false, they're motivated by a desire to line their own pockets and with, with money and not get whipped and beaten and imprisoned and killed. And yet that's exactly what happened with the apostles. They were whipped and they were beaten and they were imprisoned and they were killed because they held to the testimony of the risen Christ. It brought them, it brought them torture. It brought, them, it brought them pain and suffering. And ultimately, for many of them, execution, except for, for John. Their testimony, it didn't, it didn't give them political power. It didn't give them monetary gain. Just the opposite. Listen to me. Hypocrites and martyrs are not made of the same stuff, folks. Someone might die for a lie if they know it's the truth. 
We saw that happen on September 11th, didn't we? They might die for a lie if they, if, 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 excuse me, if they think it's the truth. They might die for a lie if they think it's the truth. But no one dies for a lie if they know it's not the truth. And these t- disciples testified and they said, Jesus is alive. We know he's alive because we've seen the living Christ. And so what Paul's saying is, if Christ is not risen, then we're false witnesses. We're phonies. We're imposters. But we know that he's alive. We're not fakes. We're not frauds. But the implications get worse. He's saying, you know what? If you're saying that, that Christ did not rise, then the biggest charge of all is not the disciples, but it's Jesus himself. Because if, if Jesus is not risen, if he's not alive, then he does not deserve our empathy or our sympathy. He deserves our anger and hatred because he said himself in Matthew 17, before he even crawled upon the cross, he says, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed in the hands of men and they will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. And Jesus is not a charlatan because he did what he promised he would do. Now think about this for, two, uh, for a second. You know, the first century, when Paul's writing this epistle to the church in Corinth, if the Jewish leaders really wanted to get rid of Christianity, because they hated Christianity. They, they looked at Christianity as a cult. The Romans hated Christianity. For many years, uh, the Christians were hurled, taken to the Colosseum and, and, and thrown to the lions. They hated Christianity. If they hated it so much and they wanted to disappear, you know what they had to do? They only had to do one thing. All they had to do was produce the body of Jesus. That's all they had to do. And they couldn't do it. And do you know why? Because the grave, that tomb, was empty. Jesus Christ is risen. Glory be to God. You know, the, the, you know, but if Christ is not risen, let's continue the argument Paul's making here. If Christ is not risen, there's also another tragic effect. If Christ is not risen, he goes on to say, then sin is still supreme. Look, look at what he says in verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If Jesus Christ is still in the grave, then you are still accountable and guilty of your sin debt before God. You see, the resurrection is a validation. It was kind of like a receipt after you go and purchase something. You know, and Jesus, when he died on the cross, he was paying your debt of sin. And the resurrection was that proof that that purchase had been made. It was a validation. The resurrection is a validation of the payment of your sin debt. And, 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 and the word still is important in this text. He says, you are still in your sins. And that's important for us to remember because that is our very nature. From the very moment we're born in this world, we have the nature of sin within us. And rebellion is inherent in us from the very moment that we enter into this world. So if Jesus Christ is not risen, then you are still in your sins. You're engulfed in your sins. You're plunged in your sins. You're held captive in your sins. Sin still rules and still dominates your life. And sin is a problem that every single one of us have. If it were not for the risen Christ, we would still have that problem. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, you need a Savior. You need a sacrifice. You needed someone to pay your penalty. The sinless one paid for my sins. He took my place. And the resurrection is God's stamp of approval on Jesus' perfect life and on His atoning death. But you needed someone to be your substitute. Because there's only one mediator between God and men, and that is the person in Jesus Christ. But if Christ is not risen, then you are still in your sins. And that means this. That means when you died, you would still have to give an account for everything that you've ever done. And you would have upon you the full justice and wrath of God, and you would have to deal with that sin instead of Jesus dealing with it. And when you stood before God, if you're, sin, if you're still in your sins, when you stand before God, there is no hiding place. There is no hope for mercy. There is no loving Christ to say, I've paid the penalty on his behalf or her behalf. I've taken their place. I've loved them and given myself for them. Instead, we will stand before God alone and we will get everything we deserve for every evil action, for every evil thought, for every 
stream of rebellion we've had toward God. But thank God that we no longer have to be in our sins because we do have a risen Savior that proves our sin debt has been paid. And there's one other consequence if there's no Easter. I want to spend a little bit more time on this because it's what we most often think about at Easter. And it's this, that if Christ is not risen, then death still has dominion. Verse 18 says this, Then those who also have, been, have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. I want you to think with me for just a moment about the worst thing about life. Now some of you might be thinking, well, I know what the worst thing about life is. Some of you young people are like, well, school's the worst thing about life. No, that's not. Some of you older people are like, well, the worst thing about life is going to work every, every Monday morning. Some of you are even shaking. You that. I don't like that, Brother Andy. It's the worst thing about life. No. I'll tell you what ruins life more than anything else is death. And if you've lost someone, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, every single minute on the face of this planet, 105 people die. Every single minute, 105 people. Every single minute. Now, that's a hard number to even wrap our minds around. That means 6,300 people die every hour. That means that 151,000 people around this planet die every single day. And 55 million people plus die every single year. Generation after generation sees the same cycle of life and death. I know Nicolas Cage may be some of your, one of your favorite actors. I'm going to probably crush your spirits. I want to give you a quote from Nicolas Cage. He was once asked in an article about Vogue magazine about his philosophy for life. Listen to how he responds. He says, we are here to ruin ourselves, to break our hearts, to love all the wrong people, and then die. I don't think Hallmark's going to call him anytime soon. That's a very fatalistic look at life. But in truth, death is the great equalizer. There is no way to escape it. Doesn't matter how much you try to delay it. All of Hollywood is getting their lips filled with stuff. I've t told you before, when they die, they can, they can donate their bodies to Tupperware. You, know, you, you can't put it off. You may try to put it off. You can't put it off. It doesn't matter how successful you are. It doesn't matter how popular you are, how famous you are. Death will come for every single one of us. And we're, so we're all fighting a battle that we can't win. But there is one victor over death, and his name is Jesus. And so Paul is saying if Christ isn't risen, then death has the victory. If there's no resurrection from the dead, then every saint, every Old Testament believer, every Christian who, who, who has died would be forever gone. That there's no hope beyond the grave. No promise beyond this cruel world. That those people who you loved and that are dead and gone, that you cared about, your family, your friends, that you would never see them again. That they're left in the ground to rot and to decay, and that's it, and it's all over. That death is one and life is just a colossal bad dream. Are you going to ask me to believe that God created this entire universe and tends for it all to run down to the grave and that's the end? That we're born crying and live complaining and die disappointed and that's it? That the only hope that we ever have of getting sicker and sicker until we die or, or it all ends in a senseless, meaningless tragedy? That there is zero hope? No, I don't believe that. I can't accept that. And I won't. I heard a story a while back about a family and they had four children. And they tragically lost three of their four children to an infectious disease. One child was left, he was a four-year-old boy, and the family had buried their, their third child two weeks before Easter Sunday. But on Easter morning, those parents went with that remaining child to church, and that mother taught her Sunday school class, and she taught in that class about the resurrection of Jesus. And the father read the Easter story as he led the opening Sunday school devotion. Remember when people would gather in the auditorium before Sunday school started for a simple devotion. That's what he did. And he shared about the resurrection of Jesus. And people who knew about their great loss wondered how both of them could do what they did that day. There's another family there, and on the way home, 
That young man asked his dad on the car ride from home. He said, Dad, that family, especially that couple, they must believe everything about the Easter story, don't they, Dad? And that dad said, well, son, of course they do. All Christians do. And that young man said this. He said, but not like they do. As a pastor, I've been in many homes and prayed for and visited with those who had lost loved ones. And I can tell you from experience, when that loved one has passed away and lived a life of faith and devotion to God, I'm so grateful that I can look in their eyes of that loved one that they're leaving behind and I see the hope of heaven. I'm so glad that when I stood by the grave of my mother, and the grave of other loved ones who have gone before and gone since, that I didn't have to wonder whether or not I would see them again. That I can stand in full assurance knowing that every person that I have ever loved who's said yes to Jesus and repented of their sins and believed on Christ for that saving hope that I will see again one day. I'm so everlastingly glad that's the kind of gospel that I get to preach. I'm so glad that this world does not have to end in a veil of tears as we say goodbye, never, ever, ever to ever meet again. Oh, friend, there is a greater hope. There is something better. Because I know the one who conquered the grave and offers life everlasting. And his name is Jesus. And if you don't know him, I beg you, I beg you to please, please say yes to a saving power today. But, if Christ is not risen, then death still has dominion. And finally, if Christ is not risen, then the future is futile. Notice what it says in verse 19. It says, "If if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. What he's saying is, he's saying if this is all there is, it's just bad news. If Christ is not risen, then we are in a pitiful situation. We are miserable people. The good times are but for a moment, and then it's just going to get worse. You're going to get older and older, and sicker and sicker, and either time or disease will take away your body and your life. And one by one, you'll see your loved ones stripped away by sickness and suffering and death. And And it means... That no matter what we go through in life, the pain and the suffering, it just, it's all meaningless if Christ is not risen from the dead. That there's no purpose in it. And that life is true like Ernest Hemingway once said. He said that he captured the essence of a hopeless life when he wrote these words. It's as though we're a colony of ants living on one end of a burning log. You think about people without Jesus. What do they have to look forward to? other than a hole in the ground. Without the risen Christ, we are miserable, pitiful people. The whole thing of time and space is a bad joke, and it makes no sense, and it's all chaos if Christ is not risen. But I want to give you some good news (laughs) as we close. Here's the seventh point. Christ is risen. That's the good news. That's what he says in verse 20. I I love how it's put. So he's arguing all for the negative. If Christ is not risen, this is horrible, and that's horrible, and this is horrible, and that's horrible. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. You know, Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, praise God for the butts. (laughs) I like that. I was going to use that today. Praise God for the butts. And the Bible, that's one of the most important words. It's an important conjunction. It it, it sends the argument in the total opposite direction. So this entire passage, it turns a 180 in verse 20. Because he's saying, Christ is risen from the dead. It's a declaration. It's a statement of fact. So the question for you is, how does the resurrection change everything? So when we've come here today, by the way, we aren't just celebrating a historical fact. You know, I studied history when I was in school. And I remember some history, Suclid Empire, stuff like that. None of it changed my life. I don't care anything about Cleopatra. I don't care anything about stuff like that. And and you can get historical facts, but we aren't here celebrating and praising Jesus just because of a historical fact. We celebrate because Jesus is still alive now. 
The risen Christ is still alive and risen today. Christ, it says, is the first fruits of those who fall fallen asleep. Now, what does that mean? That means in the Bible there are several instances of people coming back from the dead. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is totally different because other people, when, when they died again. But that's not the case with Jesus Christ. So when we say that Jesus Christ is risen, we don't just mean that Jesus Christ came back to life once upon a time and, and then he died again. No, we say when he is risen that Jesus Christ conquered death completely. He's ascended to the Father and he sits on the throne of heaven today. Right now, at this very moment, the risen Christ is still ruling and reigning. And that changes everything. So how does Easter change everything for me? Three things real quick before we go. Number one, <laughs> it affects, he's ready to go. He's like, oh, 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 we're almost done. Three more things. Amen. I like those amens too because I'm, I'm ready for Easter dinner myself. You saving me candy? No, oh, we're good. All right, here, I'm going to get more candy if we get done early. Here we go. First of all, it's going to affect my past mistakes, my present life, and my future reality. In other words, I'm going to tell you how quickly how it does that. Since Christ is risen, my past is forgiven. Since Christ is risen, my past is forgiven. Jesus paid for my penalty on the cross, my sin debt on the cross. In other words, I don't have to be a slave to sin anymore, and you don't have to be either. And you don't have to pay for your sins. Your debt has been wiped away. Your slate has been wiped, wiped clean once you repent of your sins and place your faith in the risen Christ. Jesus paid it all. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Now, does that mean that we should keep on sinning, that grace may abound? No, Paul argues that in the Romans. No, you shouldn't keep on sinning. You shouldn't keep doing that. But because Jesus Christ is risen, my past can be forgiven. And so my failures in life are not fatal, spiritually and eternally fatal for me. Secondly, because Jesus is risen, my present is meaningful. So my past is forgiven and my present is meaningful. You know, I have the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ every Sunday here at the Potter's House. I'm grateful for it. I praise God for it. I'm grateful that's God's vocational calling on my life. But every single one of you who have been born again and accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you also have that same honor of sharing the hope of Jesus Christ to the world around you. That the sharing of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel is profitable. It makes a difference. It changes lives. There's nothing else on the face of this earth that changes lives from the inside out like the, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People who were once addicts are set free. People who were slaves to sin are set free. You know, hearts are reconciled to God. There is nothing else in this world that offers that. The Bible says that in Jesus Christ, we are a new creation, that old things have passed away and all things have become new. It matters. Your faith matters now. You know, how you live your life matters. It's meaningful, it's purposeful. You know, if you have the living Christ living in through you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, what you do and what you say and how you walk with God, it matters. It's meaningful. It's purposeful. I'm going to tell you what else is meaningful and purposeful. Even the suffering and the pain that you endure, this side of heaven, is meaningful and purposeful. I'm going to tell you something. If God can take the most evil thing that's ever happened to the most perfect person who's ever lived and used it for redemptive purposes, then surely... He can use whatever pain in my life and suffering in my life for redemptive purposes for someone else if he sees fit. What you do and how you live, it matters. It's meaningful. And God can use it for redemptive purposes. So because Christ is risen, my present is meaningful and my life is, is not futile. And finally, because Christ is risen, my future is secure. My future is secure. You know... This passage is important because it reminds us that Jesus Christ is the first fruits to rise from the dead. You know what that means? Is that Jesus is the earnest money. He's the very first to rise from the dead. He's the first one. That means that there is more to follow. That means that death does not defeat those who place their faith in him. That means also that in the resurrection I'll be as Christ is. 
You know, that, 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 doesn't mean, that means that, that we're going to have a resurrection body just like the Lord Jesus Christ. That we're going to have a body that will be fitted for our eternal home in heaven. It's a body that will never tire. It will never grow weary. It will, we, we will never grow weary of worship and praising God. And I don't know about you all, but I, I like the idea of a body without aches and pains. As soon as I hit 40, I'm like, I know what everybody's complaining about now. It's like it's a ticking time bomb. I've reached 100,000 miles on this thing. It's happened. Is everything starting to break down? But, <laughs> yeah, somebody agrees with me. I'm so glad somebody's still awake. But I'll be glad we don't have a body that's full of pain and suffering and hurt and that, that we'll have a body where every tear is wiped away from our eyes and we'll be in a place that suffers no more sorrow and no more death, and that is because our Savior is risen. And that also means that you don't have to fear death today. You know, I know there's a lot of weird stuff going on because the eclipse is coming. And they're like, oh my goodness. I, you know, they're reading all this stuff from all bunch of weirdos, and they're thinking, oh no, it, the world's ending on April the 8th. Now here's the thing, it may, it may end before then. Yeah, Jesus may come back before then, but I'm just telling you the truth. A lot of people are afraid about dying. If you're, if, if you're afraid to face God, let's take care of that today. Let's take Because you're not promised tomorrow. Let's take care of that today. I'm going to tell you something else. Your, your future is so secure. Not only can you have an eternal home with God, but anything you face this side of heaven, you have a living hope. You know, Peter says this in First. First uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that, that we have a living hope. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because of the risen Christ, we have a living hope that carries us through life, that carries us through suffering, that carries us through pain. You remember the old hymn we used to sing? We sang it this morning, didn't we? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future and life is worth the living because he lives. As we close today, how can I talk about this blessed fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and not give you an opportunity to respond to this truth? Here's again the question. Has the res resurrection of Jesus Christ changed everything for you? Has it? Has it truly changed everything for you? Maybe you're sitting here today and it hasn't changed anything for you. Simple thing for you to do today is examine to whether you're in the faith. That's the main thing. Because it should change everything for you. It shouldn't be just an event or a day or a holy party where we come to church and we sing and we shout and it's all over. But a lifestyle and a living hope that lingers long after this day. Because we do have a living hope. So let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross of Calvary? And do you believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead? Then I urge you to throw yourself upon his mercy. He loves to receive sinners. He's the friend of sinners. He came in to seek and save that which is lost. And I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter how sinful you are, that he can save you today. Do you have that living hope? I pray you do. Let's, let's pray together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord God, we're so very grateful for this living hope of Jesus Christ. Lord, that this, this world does not have to end in a veil of tears and hopeless despair. But we can face whatever happens tomorrow or what, fa what faces us in the cemetery, in the valley of the shadow of death, because we know the one who conquered sin and hell and death itself. Lord, we celebrate that today. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here that needs to realize and accept this wonderful truth. Lord, they do that before it's eternally too late. That they would just simply pray and, and acknowledge your goodness and your gratefulness and just thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Acknowledge that you rose from the grave and throw themselves on your mercy by repenting of their sins and proclaiming Jesus and now be the Lord of their lives. Lord, I pray that takes place in the heart and the mind of someone here today. And, Lord, to be radically and completely changed. Lord, I pray that we as Christians, that we would live this out in our lives. Lord, that, 
that how we live, it's, it's meaningful, it's purposeful. Our, our faith matters. The way we walk in this life matters. So Lord, may we carry the hope of the gospel because it does indeed change lives. We ask all these things in Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together during this time of response. In our church, we always give people an opportunity to respond to the gospel message. So if you would like to come today, if you'd like for me to pray with you, if you'd like someone else to come pray with you, you're welcome to do so. If you want to come pray by yourself, you can. But if you need to accept Jesus Christ, your Savior, please take me by the hand, and I'm going to give you to someone else who can tell you about you can have the hope of heaven and salvation in Christ Jesus. Let's sing together. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Jesus, Jesus.